We've been talking about Friedrich Hayek's critique of John Kenneth Galbraith's argument in the affluent society about the dependence effect, the idea that desires can depend on production in a way that makes us lose confidence that satisfying those desires will improve a person's welfare. And he suggests there's a broad misallocation of resources as a result. In particular, he says that in general, public goods are things that we produce in order to meet genuine desires, but private goods are things that are generally produced in order to meet contrived desires, to satisfy contrived desires. The idea is supposed to be that satisfying our genuine desires can reasonably be expected to improve our welfare, but satisfying our contrived desires cannot be. And so he says society in general misallocates resources, directing too many resources to satisfying private concerns, private goods, private desires for private goods, and not enough to respond to genuine desires for public goods. And so society ought to be spending, he thinks, much more on clean air, clean water, education, parkland, um, natural beauty, nat national parks, etc., etc., than it does, and spends too much on private goods. Friedrich Hayek is highly critical of this notion. There are many reasons for that. I've already talked about some of them. But here I want to focus on that question of public versus private goods. Why should we think there's that kind of difference? That is to say, why should we think there's any correlation between genuineness and the public nature of the good? Now, at first glance, you might say, well, because public goods don't advertise in the way that the makers of private goods do. In fact, nobody makes the public goods. Nobody makes the air, the water, the parkland, and so on. And so you might say, look, those are things that people want just intrinsically. Many of them are needs. Um, that's quite different from a kind of product that you actually have to advertise to make people know that it even exists, let alone that they want it. It's a plausible thought. But Hayek thinks there's actually a hidden complexity here, that in the end it's not obvious at all that society is misallocating resources. And he's highly suspicious of calls on the part of Galbraith or others to push more economic decision-making away from the free market and toward government, toward an authority that has coercive power. So let's look at some of his arguments. First of all, Galbraith must be assuming that wants that are satisfied by public goods are genuine wants in general, whereas private goods are generally things that satisfy non-genuine wants, contrived wants. But why should we think that's true? Why should we think that public goods in general satisfy genuine wants while private goods generally satisfy contrived ones. Maybe that's true. It is true that we don't have to advertise the air and water and open spaces, whereas people who make cameras, for example, or lamps or books do have to advertise their products. But partly that's just a question of availability and accessibility. I don't have to find out about air and water, whereas I do have to find out about a particular publisher, a particular book, a particular camera or brand of camera, and so on. So partly there's a communicative task that has to be fulfilled in the case of private goods that isn't there in general for public goods. But now, of course, some public goods are such that there is such a thing. Particular kinds of education, for example, are things that have to be communicated to me. I don't naturally desire a knowledge of physics, let's say, in the way that I have a natural desire for food and water and shelter. And so those things have to be communicated to me. The same thing is true for other sorts of cultural productions. And think about the number of public expenditures that are not just for protecting air and water and providing people water and power and things of that kind, but instead are involved in cultural production. National public radio, public television, museums, historical exhibits, concerts, concert series, orchestras. <laughs> there are many things that governments actually sponsor as public goods. All of those cultural productions are things that people need to find out about. They're not immediately accessible, and people have to often advertise in order to do this. Now, not advertise in exactly the way a private company would, 
But nevertheless, people have to let you know about the existence of the museum. So those things are things that have a lot of the characteristics of private goods in the sense that people have to find out about them. And somebody who is in charge of, let's say, the historical society is going to want to inform people and give them a desire to visit the museum, for example, or to visit the historical park. They need to communicate. They need to advertise. In short, it's not clear why the argument that Galbraith gives can't apply to a large range of public goods. There's another problem, though. We've talked about the distinction between genuine wants and contrived wants, but we've also talked about this problem of specificity. I have, in general, a desire for food. It's surely an original want. It's not contrived. It's something that is genuine. But now my desire for that particular pizza from that particular shop, well, that's been produced by the existence of the shop and by advertising, by my trying the pizza and so on. The more specific desire is the result of something being produced in me, but the general desire is not. Now, I think that's typical. We have a general desire for something. In fact, companies can really only sell a product by appealing to one of these general and original desires, something that is certainly genuine, but of course then has to actually produce a desire for that product, a much more specific desire. And that is the result of being produced by the act of communicating about the product. We're going to have to do the same thing with public goods. We'll have to let people know, hey, Heritage Park is just up the street and it has some very nice historical displays. It has some great open area. Hey, look at the art museum. There's some beautiful things there. Those are things that have to be communicated and made more specific too. So in short, as soon as we move from a generic kind of public good, air, water, to something much more specific like that park or that museum, suddenly we face the same problem. It looks like that desire, being more specific, has to be produced too. So if anything, it looks like Galbraith's argument is saying, it's fine to have these general desires, but no specific desires. But here we can recall the point of H.A. Pritchard, the British philosopher who pointed out that there's always a gap between duty or obligation and action. There's a similar gap between desire and action. My desire, my duty, my obligation, whatever it is, is always for a kind of thing. I want a camera. And that's different from my action of buying not just some generic camera, but this camera. I may want to visit a park, but that's different from the desire to visit that park. In general, desires are things that can be satisfied by a number of different actions, by a number of different products. Does it matter to me whether I have this camera or that camera? Maybe that kind of camera as opposed to this kind of camera, but that particular one off the assembly line as opposed to that one? The desire is satisfied by either one. And so that same gap is going to happen with respect to public goods too. One thing to want open spaces, another thing to want that particular park. In general, we might say, this is a problem about general as opposed to specific desires, as it were kind level, type level desires, as opposed to token level actions and token level desires. And it seems to have little to do with the importance relatively of satisfying those desires. It seems moreover to apply in just the same way to private goods and public goods. Hayek is deeply concerned about another point, and in a way a much more fundamental point. There is a huge difference between public and private goods that Galbraith is overlooking. When I select and purchase a private good, it's something that I choose. I undertake that as a free action. A public good, on the other hand, is not chosen by me. It's chosen by someone else. It is chosen by maybe the Austin City Council or the Texas legislature, or the Environmental Protection Agency, or someone who is not me, and over whom I have very little control or even influence. And so think about the contrast here. A few years ago, I had an opportunity, after not playing for many, many years, to play bass in a band. And so I quickly needed a bass guitar. My old one didn't work anymore. I want a new bass guitar. I began looking around. And what did I do? At first, I had a desire for a bass guitar. Then I did some research. I looked at ads. I looked at various reviews, comments from bass players and so on. And I essentially said, well, okay, within my price range, here are the things I want. I want either a Music Man or a Fender or a Warwick. And then I began to 
find out what was available near me and somebody was selling a used Warwick that week and so I went over to look at it and my desire in short for a bass guitar within a few days became a desire for a Warwick or Fender or Music Man and then became a desire for that Warwick. Well, that's what I ended up buying. But notice at each stage of that process, I was the one who specified it. I decided I want a bass guitar. I decided, well, I want one of those three brands. And then I want that particular Warwick. And so throughout that process of specification, going from the very general desire to something that was a highly specific desire and a particular desire for that instrument, well, I made the choice at every one of those steps. Contrast City Council. I'm not involved really in any way in any of those steps. City Council may say, we want to do something that actually preserves and advertises <laughs> the cultural legacy of the city. I didn't choose that, but they do. They then say, well, what's important about the cultural legacy of our city? And they pick something. They say, well, it's being the live music capital of the world. And they decide that that's going to be the slogan and that's the thing they champion. And then they say, well, who is a musician that represents Austin? They choose actually two, um, Stevie Ray Vaughan and Willie Nelson. And then they erect statues to Willie Nelson and to Stevie Ray Vaughan, displayed on opposite sides of the river. Okay, I've got nothing against all that. It's fine. But I didn't choose any of that. I was not involved in any way in those decisions. Somebody else chose that. Now, maybe they were good choices. I think they were. Maybe they weren't. I don't know. But the point is, I didn't choose them. Now, that's the case with public goods in general. I may have a desire for open spaces. I may have a desire for cities to preserve their cultural legacies. But that's not to say I am actually involved in any of the ways that those get specified. So I choose what bass guitar I buy. I don't choose what statues are erected in my city. I don't choose even the kind of person who is commemorated in these statues. I don't get to choose which paintings are hanging in the art museum or even whether there will be an art museum as opposed to something else. And so all of those things, you might say, are ones where I am ceding control to somebody else. Well, that in general takes place to the extent that a society uses central planning. We take decision-making power out of the hands of individual people and place it in somebody else's hands. We take freedom away from the individual and give it to people who are government officials. Now, two things happen thereby. The people lose their voice. They no longer have a say in exactly how this happens. But secondly, Notice that the government isn't like a private company in a very, very important way. The government has coercive power. You can decide you're not buying the product that that company produces. You can't decide to no longer buy the product that that government is producing without moving out of the jurisdiction of that government. Now, you might do that. You might get fed up enough with the Austin City Council that you move to Pflugerville. You might get fed up enough with the Travis County leadership that you move to Round Rock. Maybe then you get fed up with the whole Austin metro area and you move to Houston. Then you get fed up with Texas and you move to New York. However that goes, <laughs> notice there's a huge disruption in your life when all that happens. And so you can't easily stop. Whereas I can decide, you know what, this pizza isn't as good as it used to be, or I'm on a diet, I better not eat this pizza anymore. And you can make that choice. You can't make that kind of choice about public goods. So now we can raise a different kind of question. Which is more likely to improve your welfare, a public good or a private good? You pick the private good, somebody else picks the public good. Hmm, now it's not clear to me at all that a public good is going to be better off. In fact, Hayek says it's almost guaranteed to be worse off. There is no reason for you to think that the person choosing that public good is choosing it the way you would have, or in a way that will improve your welfare. But the person choosing the private good is you. And so you have very good reason to think that choosing that will improve your welfare. And so in short, it seems to me that as soon as we start comparing private goods and public goods, on a par, will feel the force of Hayek's argument that actually that balance does not go in favor of the public goods. They're chosen by other people. 
whereas we choose private goods, that's a pretty strong reason to think that actually selecting them will improve our welfare. It's up to us.